Welcome, everyone, to the first recording of this episode. I'm totally not lying right now. <laughs> this is a new episode of Connect This, and we've just relaunched the stream. So for everyone who's watching live, you're awesome. Thank you for your patience. We are having a very exciting show. We've had a little bit of technical difficulty because it's, it's Marin's first time, and we have a definite roasting of, of people when they do the first thing. I demanded that she screwed up, so I would look really good for getting it right last week. <laughs> We have this, this episode is the great open access reversal, how ISPs do it. We're going to be talking about open access networks from the perspective of the internet service providers that make it work. And I am very excited because this is something I have never seen this anywhere else. And we are going to uh, really get into some interesting details here. We're going to be doing it with Cameron Francis, who is the CEO of Beehive Broadband and a man that continues to show board, board judgment in that he did research the show before he agreed to join. So uh, I'm not taking any responsibility for what happens next. <laughs> Thank nice you, Cameron. Thank you, Christopher. We also have Pete Ashdown, who is the owner of X Mission, Utah's first internet service provider, and one of the amazing first single digit guests on the Community Broadband Bits podcast eight years ago, nine years ago, something like that. Welcome back, Pete. Nice to see you again, Christopher. Christopher. We also have Kim McKinley, who needs no introduction. She's wearing the glasses that we all love. Thank you, Kim, for coming back. I think that that you are the um, the vice president of Utopia, um, um, the second in command, whatever that, whatever you're calling that now. Whatever my title is, I don't know. I'm uh, the chief marketing officer here, um, so I, you know, I just do all the fun stuff. Like that's all I want to do here at Team Utopia. I'm sure that's exactly what your job is. All the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we also have Pete. Um, I already read that one. We have Travis Carter, the guy whose name I should remember from USI Fiber here in Minneapolis, who wants to know why he should ride someone else's rails. He's going to be our skeptic perhaps today, asking some Ooh, tough questions. I'm, I'm excited about this one. I'm, I'm, I'm willing and ready to learn. But uh... Travis will try anything. He's, he's doing Terragraph, right? Is that a secret? We, no, we actually, secret. yeah, we, we have some Terragraph we've been playing with. So, um, you know, in, in our downtown corridor where fiber construction is incredibly expensive, I'm sort of a little bit open to the idea of more wireless. Maybe. We'll see. Okay. So. And I'm Christopher Mitchell, the talky guy from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Uh, do all, well, I can't say that anymore. We've launched some other shows, so I'm not the only one. This is exciting, though. This is a landmark Connect This episode where we have 25% more people than we've ever had before. So a little bit of an experiment. Maybe that's why we've already cratered one time. Uh, I don't know for sure. Um, I am going to make sure that I pay attention to comments. So people should feel free to put comments in to ask us uh, questions along the way that we that I might be missing. And I can take credit for thinking of those questions. Uh, we do have a quick opener, a quick open question to give people a chance to speak up. And I'll ask each person, uh, federal and state grants should require open access infrastructure, yay or nay, and why in one sentence. Uh, you know, what, Travis, I'm going to start with you for once. I bet you're, you're half asleep. Federal grants should require open access. Federal and state grants. You get money from the government, you should be required, you should be required to serve, to share that infrastructure with others. What is the infrastructure? Fiber? Exclusively? Yes. In this case. <laughs> I, I like the look of disappointment. <laughs> Uh, you know what? I'm I just got thrown over the bridge in the whole Monty Python like world. Yes, I'm going to hold my opinion until the end because I'll be honest with you, I am confused at the topic of open access. Now, that being said, we had open access back in 1995, which I believe, Pete, you and I were in the dial-up internet business right back then. So we've had a version of this. I'm real curious to hear how the fiber version of it is. So can I answer the question at the end? You know what you want. You're the co-host. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cameron, Cameron, do you have a, a response to that? I, uh, in, in a nutshell, I guess I, I would say nay. <laughs> Sorry, Kim. But, uh, you know, it may work in highly populated, uh, you know, metropolitan areas. It works less well uh, out in the rural communities. Uh, that's, that's one reason I would say nay. You are not alone in that answer, I know. And you can Pete. disagree with me, Cameron. You can disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, what do you say? Do I think open access is a good idea? 
should be required they, if you get federal or state money to build yeah, a I network. Yeah, I do. I think I think it's the best model, and um, it's dismaying to me to see how many communities uh, put in fiber um, and don't make it open access, and they are federally funded. And Kim, I believe that if you're using federal dollars, that the federal government should own those lines and they should lease them to uh, to uh, ISPs. I don't I don't think that we should subsidize uh, private companies uh, to to build fiber networks. I, I so I you that. you introduced a whole another uh, show here. I feel like you're just creating opportunities for you to come back on future shows. <laughs> What would it mean for the government to own it? I mean, you mean um, the uh, operator or the federal government? Um, did you mean the Whoever is giving the grant. So if the state's okay. giving the grant, then the state should own it. If the federal government's giving it, I think it it should be a government-owned um, asset instead of a privately owned asset. You're just getting on my left flank there. I'm not expecting that. Uh, you know, for me, I I feel like I, I can't give a <laughs> yay or nay <laughs> because I'm constitutionally incapable. I think it's a really good idea. I think there's a reality that if we were to do that, as Cameron said, I think it would slow deployment in rural areas. And I have real moral qualms with how that would work out. I don't think it would permanently prevent it in rural areas, but it would require changing business models for the people that have done the most work in rural areas. And, um, and so I have concerns about that. Um, so that was one of our best quick sessions ever. We got it done quickly. That's the goal. We're going to do some short background so people understand um, who Pete and Cameron are um, in a second, what, what their companies do. Uh, but I am going to pull out a picture now so we can quickly share information about um, the um, – um, so that we can basically help people better understand the stuff that they see every day and how it relates to our infrastructure. So I'm going to share that. All right. Jeez, where'd you find this mess? It's out in my backyard, beyond my backyard, neighbor's yard. So, so um, if you ever, if there's ever been a debate for underground networks, here's a classic example. <laughs> <laughs> so we switched from wireless to wired. So I'm going to start off with this. I see some some um, um, coax ports here. Yeah, Somewhere a, around here. Yep, cable amplifier, it looks like. Okay, so why is what's a cable amplifier, Travis? Well, it amplifies the signal down your down the block. Um, so you have a little guide wire there that the cable is hanging on. You have a co and guide wire. Yep, you got your little guide wire there. You got an amplifier. I don't know what that little box is, is in front of the, the to the left. Oh. Maybe maybe the other guys do. I'm, I'm not familiar with what that is. So that's your cable. Your cable network below that is CenturyLink. This here? Mm hmm So I do not have fiber in my neighborhood, although neighborhoods no. near me do. It looks like um, the next little the little hook there is your drops to houses. Um, Almost. All that, that little mess right below oh, that one. This yeah, one. That. And that little doohickey there. Hmm. What do you guys think? Probably a uh, distribution panel of some sort because it's breaking out the twisted pair into that, it looks like. First of all, Travis, yeah. I just need to stop that you use the word doohickey. <laughs> well, I, I'm from the upper Midwest, so and I am 50 years old, so it was... I, I can't keep up with everything that's politically correct, so I think that one's still good. <laughs> it looks like an outdoor punch down. Is that, that's what I was thinking it is, yeah. Yep. So right. that there's is probably, a... There's probably 110... Uh, 110 uh, dual terminals in there for phone lines. You can see the 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 line coming through the bottom that goes up, and and that's probably no the little gray over in the middle. Yeah, oh. the middle, yeah that little, probably distributes yep. out to different yeah. houses. So that is yep. I I'm in agreement with you. So this one is a very typical neighborhood aerial configuration. That's in your backyard. Well, it's uh, in the alleyway, and that's delivering your internets right now. Well, the over the coax, yes. Very nice. And I'll and I'll say that I am in one of Comcast's best territories, from what I can tell. I I know very technical people across St. Paul who have their home networks configured correctly, and they have many more outages than I do. So uh, I I just got lucky. Um, so that is something we'll continue doing unless people demand that I stop. I think it's useful. Um, let's talk a little bit about who we have on the call here. So I want to start with you, Cameron. Uh, tell us a little bit about Beehive. So uh, Beehive Broadband is a, is a DBA for a collection of four companies. We're uh, almost 60 years old. We, do, uh, we provide service in uh, Utah, Nevada. 
Uh, a lot of service along the Wasatch Front, uh, an area that we call the Wasatch Front, which is roughly Ogden to Provo, all, Ogden, Salt Lake City and Provo. We serve uh, a lot of northeastern Nevada, places like Elko, Wells, uh, uh, Wendover. We, ha we have a lot of residential customers, a lot of small businesses to enterprise customers. Uh, we are also a rural service provider. So Beehive serves 44 rural communities. Uh, our, in, the, in the rural areas, we, have, we, on, we average one customer per every 17.5 square miles. So that is, uh, that's a really rural outlook. And well, that's, that's good because you're probably not going to face competition from Starlink then. Uh, you know, Starlink is a concern, right? And it, it all, I think, depends on saturation. And I don't know it, if they'll turn you on for that density, though. I think they, they might require greater density than you have, or maybe only in specific areas would they do that. Well, that would be good news for us. Um, <laughs> so we, have, we are rebuilding our network. Uh, most of those rural communities are getting fiber to the home. Uh, we, we're in a big build process uh, over the last couple of years and over the next couple of years to get everybody fiber to the home. I think it's amazing that a community that is probably 60 miles away from the nearest gas station on a dirt road can have fiber to the home. So, and we serve lots of communities like that. That's where business uh, started for Beehive. Uh, that's kind of our history. Uh, we are adjacent to the major metropolitan area of Salt Lake City. And so we have branched out into those areas as well. And we've been on the Utopia Network for Kim 16, 17, uh, sorry, since, since 2014. Maybe somewhere, somewhere in there. I don't remember exactly. These these years start melting together as I get older. I'm not so as old as Travis, but I'm I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're only on in the good years, though. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we we cover probably twelve thousand square miles. Uh, if we were a state, we would be the forty third largest our service area. So we serve a lot of uh, spread out territory as well as uh, the Wasatch Front. Great, uh, Pete. Tell us about X Mission and where the name comes from, because I you probably told me eight or nine years ago and I forgot. <laughs> well, uh, I'm a old computer geek by heart, um, and back in the Apple II days, um, there was uh, the the modem use back then used a lot of Xfer and Xmit uh, abbreviations, which were lifted from the military uh, communications. And so uh, when I had to come around with a uh, name for X Mission, when I started the company in 1993, um, I liked the idea of transmission, the idea of uh, moving ideas and objects and whatever from one point to another. Uh, and so I, I abbreviated that and came up with X Mission. Now, uh, Utah is a very religious community where they send out missionaries into uh, the field to uh, proselytize the Mormon church all over the, all over the world. And a lot of people have asked me, well, is it ex missionary? And I tell them it's whatever you want it to be. So, uh, X mission again, started in 1993 as a, a dial up provider. It was mentioned earlier. Um, we currently, uh, are one of the largest providers on utopia. I, I started with utopia back when they were, it was just a twinkle in the founder's eyes. Uh, they came and pitched me the idea, and I went around and, and sold it to city councils at the time, and I still believe it's the best uh, model for uh, public uh, fiber, fiber infrastructure out there. Um, I'm dismayed that it hasn't been copied more, um, but uh, we are one of the largest providers on Utopia. Uh, we also have a downtown data center that we provide services out of, and then we do basic services like email and web hosting as well for our customers. Excellent. Is there any, any breaking news, Kim, that you wanted to share? Um, well, we, we're always trying to break news here at Team Utopia, but I, this was last week's news um, that we uh, have just signed on our newest city, which would be Pleasant Grove, Utah. Um, it is the largest new city since the original 11 cities that we started with back in 2002, 2004. Are you um, going to tell the truth about how big it is rather than lying like you did to EPI I don't remember. Software? Like I was on the other podcast and now I forgot how big it is again. <laughs> so I was like, nice. You said 60, it's 40. Yeah, is it 40? Yeah, okay. It's 40,000. <laughs> we, we're talking to so many cities. Hopefully in the next couple months, we will be announcing another city. So we're on a roll here. Um, but I, it's, I think a lot of cities are realizing that they need more connectivity and we are seeing a lot of high demand of cities coming to us and we're um, asking for better connectivity. And, and Travis, um, did you any, share anything? 
I was just, I'm excited to have a fellow computer nerd on that remembers the days of half duplex 1200 baud modems on their Apple II, Apple IIe. So, and it know, was glorious. We loved it. It. It, it, was, it was so great when you got your first Apple Cat modem. I mean, you, you don't, <laughs> you know, I remember when you couldn't, the text was going by so fast you couldn't even read it. It was so amazing. So, it, no, I'm, um, I'm kind of taking a back seat today there, Chris, because I really am excited to learn about this open access. And then at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate for you. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, and we have a, a correction that uh, Pleasant Grove is 38,000. So now I'm in trouble for the same thing I accused you of. Was it my boss who wrote that to you? Uh, I don't think so, no. Uh, there's, there's no Darth Vader yet in the chat. So, <laughs> so I think one of the things, I, I don't know that for this audience, we need to go over how open access works, but I think it is useful to note that in the past, we've talked about software-defined networking, and this is not the way you operate currently. Um, but so, um, Kim, do you want to give us a, a sense of a quick technical overview of how, uh, what, what um, does an ISP bring and how does it work technically? I mean, you, you don't have to do it all. You could just start it off with it. you just ask me a technical question? See, you could just like br briefly describe it and then hand it off. So we are not, like you hear a lot of things about SDN. Um, we are not at SDN network because we are a carrier class active E network. Um, so with SDN, sometimes that really... Um, is more catered to residential only deployment. Um, so we are in, Utopia is in all the major data centers and uh, throughout the Wasatch Valley here in Utah. So any of the providers can connect to us at any of those major data centers. Um, so we can then connect and get them on the Utopia network. Is that a, is that good enough for you, Chris? Yeah, see, that's great. Okay. We even used Active, Active E. So, so <laughs> Pete, um, give us a sense of how you interconnect uh, on the Utopia network. Uh, well, we connect uh, through two of those data centers for redundancy uh, into the Utopia network uh, with uh, 100 gigabit connections. Um, of course, we started, gosh, I think we started with just a single gigabit um, back in the day uh, and then graduated to 10 gigabit and then multiples of 10 gigabit. And um, with the redundancy, we actually have 200 gigabits into uh, the Utopia network. And it's a, a layer two LAN for the most part for us, where it's divided into different VLANs. Um, it, the original intent would be behind the VLANs was to divide it up by city, but that kind of fell apart over the years. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the logic is that Utopia has with behind the VLANs. Now, we do have one VLAN that's set aside for um, PPPoE, um, and, and the rest of the VLANs are DHCP assigned uh, addresses for our customers. And Cameron, oh, okay. no, go ahead, Trev. <laughs> okay, so can I ask a few? I, I was going to wait till the end, but I, I'm not that patient. So, <laughs> so do you do your own address assignment per ISP? Um, yeah. Or okay, so you own your own address space, and yeah, it all comes into us uh, via layer two. And you know, I'm I'm fortunate uh, having done this for so long because we acquired a, a class B very early on. Um, so we have a lot of address space that we can use. Uh, nevertheless, we're looking at things like CGNAT uh, for the uh, IPv4 customers that um, insist on using IPv4. And, and we're also in, in conjunction with that doing an IPv6 upgrade for all of our Utopia customers. So Chris, just so you know, a class B is worth more than Bitcoin nowadays. Just uh, for, <laughs> yeah, for well, so. I, you know, I'm, I'm ready to talk about the the Pentagon's um, the sudden surge we saw in the seconds oh, yeah. before, and, and uh, why the they're hoarding them all. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, all right. No, cool. And I know that I, probably you got that class B when you got your ASN, right? I mean, like, that's the way it was back in the day. Roughly, I mean, it wasn't directly through Aaron. It was like uh, what happened is I stumbled on a customer that didn't realize what they had at the time. Well, they didn't need it at the time. Um, they were just a small office and for whatever reason, Aaron gave them a, a class B. And so I made an arrangement with them and, and we took it over. Um, and for those who don't understand the, that's class B is very old terminology. It's 65,000, uh, roughly IP addresses. But yes. back in, back in 93, when, when we applied for, we got two of them, you just applied for them and got them. They were handing them yeah. out like, like, like candy. On, well, yeah. Oh. And you could do IPv6 now too, where you get like, you know, you get like your own IPv4 space and more, I'm guessing at this point. Um, and, and so, I, anyway, my, I just wanted to say, like, this is not, I'm not just skin deep. Like this is, 
I'm not just here for the for like the, the dulcet tones. You're not just a pretty face, are you? You, you understand. <laughs> I was gonna say you're, you're not here just for the looks, Chris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My so, my evolution of the ISP business um, started with me thinking that I just wanted to do dial up, and people would come to me and say, "Hey, can I buy a T1 line from you?" And I'd say, "Well, no. You can go buy one from the University of Utah if you want." Um, and then over time, I started to realize what I was missing out on, and and um, I wish. I had the force. I remember doing a who is on enter.net and it wasn't taken. Mm -hmm. um, so I wish I had the foresight to have re reserved beer.com and enter.net and all those <laughs> domains. And, but I mean, I think a lot of people look back at it then and we thought it was all worthless at the time. Yeah. I'm not even going to talk about how um, I spent a year uh, almost every week thinking, oh, I got to set up that um, stupid, um, the Bitcoin um, stuff when, when they were <laughs> yeah. still, when, when you cracked a problem, you got 50 Bitcoins at that time. And uh, oh. yeah, that would yeah. be nice. Or, or the $8,000 pizza I bought with Bitcoin. I mean, there's their story after story of all this stuff. So <laughs> anyway, I want to get to Cameron and ask, is there anything mm -hmm. that you wanted to add in terms of the, the technology of, of how you interconnect and how it works that we've missed? You know, Pete gave a great description of how it works. Uh, I believe we connected two uh, data centers where we have an NNI with uh, Utopia as well in the Salt Lake Valley. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting setup. Uh, kind of more simply, you know, we have this handoff with Utopia. The reason that it's uh, attractive for a company like us is that there's very little cost, very little startup cost in, in order to work with Utopia. Um, Utopia essentially owns and operates the network and we provide internet service to the customers on the network. Um, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's good and bad. It's, it's great because there's low barriers for us and we're able to market and get new customers and grow. And it's fantastic that way. It does cause a little disconnect now and then when we're trying to support our customers in that, you know, we've got separate building systems, we've got separate support systems, separate from what utopias are. And so once in a while, somebody falls through the cracks or someone disconnects on one on, on Utopia's platform, but they don't disconnect on our platform. Those kind of things do happen. So, yeah, if you multiply that times 100, I think that's what Comcast back end looks like right now <laughs> from all the acquisitions they've made over the years. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. How does the how does the money work then? Uh, and Kim, I'll start with you again. You can say as much as you want and then pass it off. Um, how does the money flow? Um, I think there is many aspects to how this works. Um, so we, like for a customer, the customer actually gets two bills. So they actually get from a residential perspective. Um, they get a bill from Utopia for the infrastructure and we do our DMARC is at the ONT inside the house. Um, and then the ISP charges and we get a portion of uh, the ISP's bill um, that they remit back to us. So, it, so when you see the pricing that's advertised, it, it may look like really aggressive pricing, but there's two pieces to it. And there's a piece that's not seen uh, in our advertised price. And that's what comes back to the customer through, uh, sometimes Kim, does it come on their utility bill from their city or? There was a model back in the day that we had, uh, did, it would come from the city. Now, usually uh, the only model that we're going forward with is a bill just from us. So, and yeah, from like an ISP, depending on how an ISP would like to market, it can, they can include the, the Utopia charge or they elect, some elect not to. When Utopia markets, we do the all in price um, just so we don't feel like we're doing any bait and switching. Um, so we just kind of average the cost of all of the ISPs for that specific speed. And then we market with that. Um, and then when they call in, uh, will we figure out how to separate. So, and one thing that I think is really interesting is that somebody can sign up directly with the ISP or they can call into Utopia and we can um, handle both of those, uh, both of those parts. So we try to make it as easy and as painless uh, to the consumer as possible. But on the business side, it's very much a wholesale model. So the, uh, the businesses will only just get one bill and that would be from the ISP. So if I call Utopia and I don't have an ISP, will you assign me one or will you be the ISP? No, we will tell you that you have to pick one. And this okay. is one question we get all the time is what ISP would you recommend? Ooh, and we will okay. say, we cannot recommend an ISP. <laughs> we have to stay neutral. Um, what we do say is that we on our website, uh, we've taken all the Google review APIs and then we've embedded them on our website to say, we can't say anything, but let the uh, people who've reviewed you speak, um, review these ISPs. 
Um, and that is one way. But what we really see is a lot of, um, it's, Utah is like a very close knit culture. So you see a lot of neighbors recommending ISPs or Facebook groups recommending ISPs. Um, like I'll, I will see all, of, I'm a part of every Facebook group in every city in Utah. And like somebody will come on to one of those and go, I'm gonna join Utopia, what ISP should I pick? And then you'll just see like all, of, all the pros and cons of all the ISPs come on that thread. So I'm going to hijack this from Chris for a minute. So who owns the, the, the switch or the router in the customer's home? We own the ONT. The ISP can either provide a, a router if they elect to, or the, the, cons the customer can buy their own router. Nice catch. So, you're just, you're, so you're just providing an Ethernet handoff in the home? Mm, yes. Got it. Okay. And so we have, a, we have a mixed model. We would prefer the customer to use our equipment. Uh, that helps us with visibility, helps us with uh, understand the configuration, the Wi-Fi in the home, the signal strength. And that's good for us, but not all customers want to do that. So a uh, customer can bring his own router. And Pete, how do you know how much to remit back to Utopia uh, any given month? They send us a bill. <laughs> and what is that based on then? Is that just purely the number of people? Yeah, number of customers. And there's different grades of service as well um, that they... Uh, calculate differently. So we just get a bill from them uh, on a monthly basis and we write them a check. Um, so then I think the question that I had people reaching out to me most about was, um, and I'll stay with you, Pete, how do you differentiate yourself then from other ISPs? Uh, well, being geek run, we try and uh, push our technical expertise uh, and our service uh, quality as well. We, uh, I've always had the motto that we don't try and get you off the phone. We try and solve your problem. And uh, my technicians have uh, carried that very well and, and staying on the phone and in some cases with hour, on, for hours with people. Um, that's the kind of service they're not going to get from the big incumbents. Uh, the other thing that we do is um, we're very strong on privacy. Uh, we have pushed back against a lot of uh, privacy intru intrusion by government, which is a very important thing here in Utah. I, I would hope it's an important thing nationwide, but we demand a warrant for any sort of information from our customers because I feel like that's uh, I'm holding that information. And if the government wants it, they have to go get a warrant based on the Constitution. Um, and that goes into uh, pushing it back against uh, laws that have been created in Utah that would allow law enforcement to simply send us a, a subpoena and um, get information about a customer. And when that happened, we would push back against that and say, no, you need to go get a court order. You need to have a proper warrant. And eventually because of that, um, I worked with the Senator here in the state legislature to get that law changed to where they needed to demand a warrant. So we, we pushed back against that. We pushed back against the NSA having their uh, data center in Bluffdale here. Privacy is a big part of our, our uh, offering. Um, and the, the second thing is, is uh, we also run the uh, local internet exchange, uh, much like Utopia is a neutral uh, space for internet service providers to provide service on. Uh, the Internet Exchange is a neutral space for uh, anyone on the Internet to provide to exchange traffic with. And it's really how the Internet is is uh, based, is that if we want to hand off traffic to Google, we don't have to go through a third party to do it. Google can come to a, a neutral exchange and we can exchange traffic directly. And uh, we started the local exchange uh, in 2011 and... Um, recently upgraded it to a uh, hundred gigabit capacity and it has uh, over two dozen uh, participants on it. Excellent. And Cameron, same question. How do you, um, <clears throat> how do you compete against other ISPs on Utopia? You know, it, it's a great question because on the surface, we all might look the same. You know, the pricing is similar. You've got Kim 13, 13 or 14 choices now. Um, one of the ways that we differentiate ourselves is that we have a, an IP based video product. Uh, our customers can not only get uh, internet service from us, but they can they can get their TV service as well. Uh, we've been we've had an IP based delivery for oh, seven or eight years now, which is kind of ahead of the curve. But uh, you can sign up for TV with us as well, and we we think we have a good product at reasonable rates, and and we advertise that, and that's a draw for some customers. 
Uh, we do a lot of advertising. We, we hope that we have a good reputation and take care of our customers. And there is truly a word of mouth uh, neighborhood type of feel to getting uh, internet service and new customers. Like heaven forbid you get on the wrong side of the Morgan City Moms Facebook group, <laughs> right? Because they'll eat you alive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have to serve our customers well. And that's, I mean, to me, when I look at this, uh, we've talked about this a little bit before, so I don't think we have to beat it to death. But uh, my sense is, is that people tend not to switch. When you get someone and you provide a good service at a reasonable price, people are, are not likely to move away uh, in general. Has that been your experience? I I think that's generally my experience, although it's uh, one of the great things about working on uh, in this model is that there's low barriers to, to getting those customers and to getting new customers, but there's also low barriers for customers uh, to leave us. We don't have any contracts. Uh, you know, they're not obligated to stay with us. Um, if, if something bad happens, uh, we could lose them overnight. And uh, that's, a, that's a sobering thought. I mean, thankfully, nothing bad typically happens. But uh, if we were to go through extended outages or whatnot, um, people would switch overnight uh, to another service. So we really have to be at the top of our game. Hopefully we are. And I think that's the, the key difference with an open access model is that the customer wins in the end. Um, if you're a captive customer on one of these traditional networks and something goes wrong, you have no choice. And so all of the internet service providers are competing uh, against each other to provide excellent service to the customer. And um, they, they win out in the end. And that's why I think this is the model that, that should be used all over the country. Is there, is there a sense among ISPs on Utopia that, that you're competitors, but you're also kind of like a family against the national companies that are kind of the ones that probably still have a dominant market share overall? You know, I used to go to city council meetings and say, I don't understand why Comcast and CenturyLink are fighting against this network because they could take a huge amount of their overhead off their books and use this network. And I still think they should be welcomed um, to uh, use Utopia as, as competitors. Uh, I still think we've wiped the floor with them. But um, I think all, all the internet service providers who are on Utopia uh, recognize um, that they still have to provide a better class of service than the incumbents. Um, and I, I'm a, a little bit dr draconian in my opinion about open access networks. I think open access, access infrastructure should go in and everyone should be forced to use it. Uh, just like FedEx and the post office and um, UPS don't run their own roads uh, that we should have one infrastructure for all data providers, no matter what they're doing. Um, this is a, it's a good conversation to come back to. I'm going to put a pin in that one too. This is a good way to, if you want to come back on the show, you just got to make declarative statements that we can't possibly cover in the time we have. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know uh, I, I hear Pete's enthusiasm and uh he, you know, we, we benefited from Utopia. I think we have a great partnership. It's going well for us. We're happy to have this opportunity. We, we love our Utopia customers. But there is a debate out there. Here, here's another big topic, right? There is a debate out there that, you know, should government or quasi-government entities use public funds to overbuild private companies? And, uh, you know, that, that debate rages on every day, right? Um, when, uh, when an open access, when a, when a city builds an open access network, they're probably displacing two or three or five or six other private companies who already provide service in that, in that city. So that's a, you know, it's a hot topic. I don't it know is. if that's a debate at all, Cameron. I have no idea what you're talking about. If it's not, so, then I, I, make, I wake up every morning making sure that it comes up. <laughs> well, and I think to counter that argument, Cameron, I think that when in the United States did competition become a bad thing? And I think... We, well, we, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I let me a, just, so as someone who's like, role. takes this a very strong position on this, I'll also say that I do think we have to be very careful when we use government power to intervene in, in markets. I think it is warranted in many cases here. Uh, I think Pete has an argument that we can have about, about how far we go with it. Um, but, uh, but I do think all sides should recognize that there is a danger of overdoing it. Um, and Kim, I'm sure you're, you, you're not. No, and I think that if, if, the, if the private companies are actually delivering and they're providing a superior service, I think that's one, that's one point of view. But you often see a lot of these 
these companies mm -hmm. in those areas who have rate hikes and they just use their monopolies for the sake of being monopolies and don't provide a superior service at a low cost. And I think that's a conversation in which I believe competition should be able to enter that marketplace, um, which I don't know if you would disagree with, Cameron, on that well, point. Yeah. I don't disagree with that at all. In fact, you know, we, we have to provide excellent service to our customers. Our, our customers have to love us or we risk losing them. Even in, I think it's becoming an increasingly busy marketplace. And uh, even in places where we have a high market share, there's an opportunity for us to lose those customers over time if we don't take care of them, if we don't treat them right. So we absolutely have to treat them right. And uh, it's just, you know, I, uh, I, I just heard a story recently about Missoula. You know, they, the Missoula City Council wanted to build their own network. Well, they had two ISPs that served the entire city and they had six others that served a portion of the city. And so should Missoula use its taxpayer money to overbuild those six ISPs that are private companies that are doing business and basically choose winners and losers, you know? So it's, uh, I agree with Kim 100%. We have to do our very best and serve our customers or, we, or we'll lose them. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it is. But there's just something that sticks about, you know, government or quasi-government organizations picking winners and losers. Yeah, I, you know, I'll just, um, I want to put a, I want to um, leave it and move on to uh, another topic related to open access. Um, I think I would just say that perhaps speaking for Pete and myself, particularly when you do open access, it's hard to argue that you're doing picking winners and losers if you're um, creating a, a common infrastructure. And still, another piece of it is that cities also have to be open to private investment. That's a requirement of the Telecommunications Act. I think it's good. I do not think, although I support open access, I do not think there should be monopolies. I'm deeply suspicious of, of monopolies uh, generally. Um, but I want to ask something that I'm, I'm curious about, which is that I've, I've been giving some thinking, I was doing some thinking about open access, and I talked with Kim about this, so I'll, I'll put it to you first, Kim. Like, I have some concerns about whether or not, let's just say that, I mean, to avoid upsetting any U.S. companies, let's say that, that Huawei decided to, like, launch in to the United States and offer services directly since we're not allowed to use their equipment anymore. <laughs> and, um, and they decided to come on and do, like, do, like, $10 million marketing campaigns, try to, like, just, like, beat up on the ISPs on Utopia um, and engage in some practices that we feel like would be harmful. A, is that, like, something to be concerned about um and what would the results be in, 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 the, in the kind of disarray that could follow what like what practices are you talking about coming in and lowballing the price and kind of just are like yeah. on the utopian network or off the utopian network on so. the utopian network. so okay. they, would, they would join the utopian network and then they would say i don't know we're going to offer a service and we're going to hide that there's 50 dollars in surcharges <laughs> <laughs> i don't think anyone would possibly do that in the united states of america i can't imagine a company lying about the prices it is going to charge its customers at the end of the month seems impro improbable <laughs> but that's sort of the issue of of whether or not someone would come onto the network engage in duplicitous pricing and kind of just throw a lot of dust in the air and and create um havoc to me, it seems like that would be dangerous. I think it, it could be dangerous. And that's why we really vet all of our partners who come on the uh, to the Utopia Fiber Network to make sure. And when, when somebody comes on the Utopia Fiber Network, we, one thing that we reiterate is that we want to have the value proposition that people can switch service providers, but we don't want to encourage churn for the sake of churn. Um, because I don't think that's beneficial to anyone on the network. If a customer is unhappy and they elect to change, then great. Um, but something that came up recently is uh, that Utopia Fiber also, like if a company chooses to market this way, chooses to try to uh, oh, go down that path, that we can we have the right to not for them to not use the Utopia Fiber name on any of their marketing materials because we don't want to be the ones who encourage that. But I think we haven't seen that because we have great partners and we we have frequent conversations with our partners and what our value proposition is. And I think that is what's different is you'll see a lot of these networks across the country who are coming in and saying, well, we have $5 gig. Well, I think that's a great proposition for those people who are getting $5 gig or whatnot. But we also understand that our, our ISPs need profit margins in order to stay in business. And they're not going to have, a, not going to stay in business with a dollar uh, profit margins. So yeah. I, I really think that it, what, why we've been successful uh, in this open access space is because of the quality ISPs and the relationships that we have with them. Um, we really view this as a partnership. Yeah. 
And, you know, we've had lots of, we have constant interaction with uh, Kim and others at Utopia and we work together constantly and it's a good relationship and we're grateful for that. You know, we, we've been approached by other municipalities who have, are building networks or who have built networks. Uh, one of them recently expressed to us their goal was for every resident to have $15 gig. And, and even a $15 gig, we just couldn't do it. You know, it just, it just couldn't, it, we couldn't be profitable and businesses can't uh, not be, pro I have shareholders, you know, I can't not be profitable. So it, it is a, it is a, there is a, there are free market dynamics. You know, there are, there, we, we, we are businesses. We have to be profitable. And we've encountered a number of uh, competitors over the, our 28 year history that come in with a loss leader um, to try and, build as many customers up as they can and then sell it off to somebody else to deal with. And uh, I've always taken the attitude that we do need to have a profit margins. We, knew, we do need to pay our employees well so that they provide good service. And I, the pandemic has, has changed this comparison somewhat, but I always compared uh, the internet service provider business to the restaurant business. You can go to any one of the national fast food chains and get food or you can go to a local restaurant and get really good food and really good service and a really enjoyable evening. Um, we try and be the latter as far as internet service providers go. And it, in some cases, our prices are a little bit higher, but people are thankful that we're willing to stay on the line with them to help them with any sort of technical problem if they call with it. And I think that's a really good point, Pete, that most people don't get is that a lot of people are not just looking for the lowest cost because some of the most... Um, the, the, the products that we see people sign up for the most are not necessarily the cheapest. Um, and I think that, that people are smarter um, than that uh, just to go for the lowest cost solution out there. It cannot be a race to the bottom. Absolutely. That hurts all of us. Now you're muted, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, Kofton didn't unmute. I'm working on some homework. Uh, there's some other issue going on where no one can hear us anymore except for ourselves. Um, so um, just so you all know, um, I don't get any more questions from the chat room. Um, <laughs> uh, but this is where I wanted to turn to Travis to see what additional questions you have, Travis. So I appreciate the information. So here's the part then. I'd love to be educated on this. So let's say we went to Utopia and we got approved as a provider so now we have we have access to the network what prevents us from doing the five dollar gig as a loss leader because this is what happened back in the dial-up days there was a 1995 a month was what dial-up internet cost in minneapolis and then some clown came to town and he came up with 995 internet and just eroded our dial-up market away almost overnight i'm just curious is is there any protections for the isps and i'll I'll combo that with another question, which is, what if Google came and wanted to be a provider? Would that, would that make the other ISPs on there nervous? Because I've had a no, I won't share a Google market because we're serving Google content as one of our key, as, as our key content providers. And I don't want to magically all of a sudden start having some problems that I got to figure out that are going on. So I, I'm just curious, you know, from a, from both a connectivity standpoint and, and from a competition standpoint. And I just want to briefly say that Travis won't compete with Google in a, in a market. I'm, I have a no dating supermodels policy myself. So um, <laughs> very similar. Yep. Is your, is your wife aware of that particular policy or what? <laughs> I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think to your point, Travis, um, there isn't like a necessarily a protection um, that somebody could that they they might come in um, and try to do a loss leader. Um, some of them have. We've done some protections that you can't change your prices like um, only but once a month because we don't want to see this back and forth kind of mm -hmm. uh like price uh, adjusting. Um, but I have had ISPs who've come to me and said, I want to do this. And what we'll do is we'll just sit down and I'll, I'll talk to them and say, why are you doing this? That's not the mission of the network. So we, it goes back to the relationship we have. And when they have, um, when we've had those conversations, a lot of them have elected not to go down that pathway, uh, which we thus far are lucky for. 
And, and I think if other it, questions, it, I'll let Pete and uh, yeah. if in. Google wanted to compete on Utopia, I would welcome it um, okay. because we don't monitor what our customers are doing. We don't have uh, we don't build <laughs> demographics around our customers advertising preferences. We don't care what they're doing on the Internet. Uh, as long as they don't att attract the attention of law enforcement with a warrant. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to go face to face against Google. I wish, uh, you know, when Google Fiber first announced that they were going to start rolling fiber all over the country, they said it was going to be an open network. And I was like, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be happy to compete against them. But uh, what I understand the story is, is that a, a, they hired somebody from the cable business who came in and said, no, 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 no. You've got to keep this exclusive to you. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, sorry, Cameron, I don't mean to jump in, but I want to ask a business question then. How do your banks look at your book of business when it rides on the open access network? Because the, there could be volatility there. And again, I, I don't know if you guys are, are using senior lenders to expand your business or not, but I, I would just be curious what that conversation looks like or sounds like. I only work with the youngest banks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we are mostly self-funded. Okay. Uh, fund out of our own cash flow for build outs in our CLEC. I mentioned we had four companies, two are ILEX and two are CLEX. And uh, in the CLEC world, which is where we're at with Utopia, it's, uh, we're self-funded pretty much. Okay. And I think we crossed that line somewhere around 1998. Um, the, you're, you're giving the banks a lot more credit in analyzing what an open access fiber infrastructure is uh, than I think most banks even understand. They're, they're just looking at our cash flow now. They don't, they don't care how we're doing it. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. And then from a personal standpoint then, there, are you guys running on Utopia and then building your own network? Or, I, you know, Cameron, it sounds like you guys are. Pete, are you doing the same? Are you leveraging the dollars you're driving out of Utopia to build your own, which would then, would then significantly improve your enterprise value? We don't do uh, last mile. We have investigated it um, back, oh gosh, well over, over 15 years ago, we did some research as far as rolling our own fiber because we were very frustrated with the situation in Salt Lake City. Um, but, uh, we depend uh, entirely on Utopia for residential access. We use a number of other fiber providers for business access, and we have a small, uh, wireless in, uh, infrastructure in downtown Salt Lake City. You know, that, it's probably a big difference between, uh, X Mission and ourselves. We, we have 60 years of history of building our own networks, and we have thousands and thousands of miles of fiber in the ground. Mm -hmm. And so we have, uh, we have uh, fiber infrastructure all up and down the state of Utah and, and Eastern Nevada that we build uh, ourselves or, okay. or with contractors. Sure. And if is is Utopia underground or aerial, Kim? We are wherever the power utilities are. So if it's underground, which most of our network is in a lot of the new cities, it's underground. But if the if the power is overhead, we'll, we usually go there if so we can get access to the poles. Help me help me understand then. If there's let's just say there's a hit, right? There's a there's a fiber cut. Um, that how never do happens. Your, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, how, how do your how do, who who manages it? Who fixes it? How do the ISPs interface back to their customers? You know, because at the end of the day, the I it's the ISP is is the customer. Is that a Utopia responsibility? If it's a hit, um, yeah, it's a Utopia responsibility. So once we have the knock, um, who is monitoring those when they see the outage, um, then they alert. Uh, we look at all the customers and we send out emails and alerts to all of our ISPs of what customers down, what area is down. Um, and then we want like to be very transparent in this. So I know X Mission has a uh, X Mission status where they announce all like uh, any kind of cuts that we have. We have a Utopia status that announces it because the last thing like that Cameron mentioned is that we, if, if it's a Utopia cut or it gets hit, we wanna say, not say it's the ISP's fault. We wanna say it's Utopia's fault or, or somebody hit it by, you know, just driving a truck down the road or whatnot. And uh, so, because we want, yet again, we, we want, don't want churn to happen for unnecessarily when it's not the ISP's fault. Um, it's, yeah, it's transparency model is the customer learns two vendors. Mm -hmm. They learn the Utopia vendor, then they learn the ISP vendor, right? Which is, which is pretty unique, right? So I guess the ISP can always blame you guys 
if there was a hit then they we try not to finger point <laughs> <laughs> we try and uh but at the same time you know we when we get a flood of customers calling in saying hey something's going on in this city sometimes we're the ones who notify utopia that something's going on so we try and keep that a, a very level partnership in that uh there's a utopia status that we will retweet and there's next mission status that they will retweet uh, in addition to our own status pages and email and notifications that we send out to our customers. And that's what it goes back to this partnership, because I hear it in the open access world is that, that like it's him over them versus us. Right. And that is not the way we work here at Team Utopia, that we really value this partnership and saying we're in this together because we we're both they're both our customers. So we have mm -hmm. to take care of them. All right. I think final question, then do you guys offer can Cameron or Pete? uh get dark fiber from you or is it always lit you can get dark fiber from us yes oh so if i'm an isp and i want to put in my my own switching not gear, for the last not necessarily okay for the not last. for the last mile okay but we we can and do have transport agreements with utopia yeah we we as well the the salt lake internet exchange that i spoke of um we have uh two data centers that are hooked up through utopia dark fiber Sorry, Chris, go ahead. You you were going to say? Oh, you're here for a reason. <laughs> Asking good questions. I am okay, it's, it's, it's just, it's interesting. Um, I, I would just, I'm surprised nobody's come in and tried to poach on it. That's all I'm going to say, but that's a great deal. You know, I think Cameron maybe is a little more worried than Pete is, is of, of that maybe happening. Um, I don't you, know. You were talking was... about... Oh, we're I was talking about the 995 uh, internet provider. I don't know yeah. if you remember freeinternet.com. Oh, yeah, was. yeah. There, there was a free dial-up provider that came in, and we thought, how in the world can we compete against that? But there's something... They come and go. I, there's something untoward about lost leaders. There's, oh, you know, I'm with you. I, I just always think of the coffee shop, right? You know, my favorite coffee shop, some large uh, entity out of Seattle with a green logo bought it. It was kitty corner from their other store. And lo and behold, after a year, there was only one there. You know, yeah. so I, I, I'm just, it's always, Chris and I have had this over uh, over chicken wings many times. I never understood because I would, I couldn't sleep at night if I didn't control the entire experience. So I commend you guys for, for, for taking a stab at it. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we've, we've got a visceral reaction to the games that some of the big players play on pricing and, and yeah. they, have, we just don't do it. So you know, once in a while, we'll have a promotion, you know, first free month, those kinds of things. But we don't play those pricing games like some do. And so uh, that kind of a loss leader just goes against the grain for us. All right. I just got more questions. Then, Chris, no, no, my turn. Uh, I get one. No, no. One real one. last one. one. Then I'll I promise I'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> MDUs, how do you handle apartment buildings? Does, you, does Utopia wire those up? We usually uh, just provide one big bulk connection. And then... Um, the ISP usually can just do what kind of wiring they want, but usually we just provide a big pulpit pipe into MDUs um, at this point. Yeah, yeah we, we in the MDUs that we service, we have um, our own switch in there that we turn ports on and off for individual customers, but the whole thing is fed by a Utopia connection. That's the typical experience for us as well. Uh, every once in a while, though, there's an apartment building where the we can't negotiate with the HOA or there's not a collective uh, body to negotiate with. And, and those residents want individual contracts. And I think we've got at least maybe one of those came with Utopia where Utopia did us the favor and built to each individual apartment. There, so there, that there... was the model back in the day, but not necessarily. Yeah. So we have some legacy ones that have that kind of uh, connectivity in them. So are there apartment buildings then in which I can choose between X mission and Beehive, or is it basically I get one or the other? There are, there are some that are out there. Um, it's a mixed model of MDUs of how that works. Yeah. In, in hindsight, do you think that Utopia sh should have taken the, you know, the end, the MDU experience similar to the SFU experience or, or not? I, I can't say, I think it's really dependent on, I think that the big pipe, one big pipe and letting the ISPs um, do it from there is probably our our favorable model um, here internally. Okay. If you've ever tried to negotiate with landlords, though, oh, man. 
you know, now now have imagine six ISPs trying to wire up a building. So, all right, this is this so, is going to be a new show because Travis has a he's a great MDU deal. He has a great MDU approach that we're going to be discussing in future shows. Can you just do MDUs as a Utopia partner? <laughs> Do you just want to be an MDU? You can be a business only provider on the Utopia network. How about it? How about just apartment buildings only? I mean, that's a business. It's if you're an ISP, okay. yeah, you could just be a business, which would be classified. Man, I'd be running all around doing the MDUs, and that's genius. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I found I found my in. All right. Hey, all right doesn't mean I'm gonna let you in, Travis. I mean, I, <laughs> I you may, well, no, that, you that's know. actually not now. That's an asset, right? You own that building. That, you know, no one else is coming in on top of you. So. That was all right. Sorry, Chris. That's all my. I missed what Cameron said. Yeah. You had a reaction there too about Travis coming in. I think I just want to make sure if oh. there's an insult to Travis, we all heard it. <laughs> you know, I was just joking that uh, who knows, Travis might not qualify to be on the Utopia Network. I, I guarantee you, I won't. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I my question: Make it through me first. That's yeah. Oh Travis. no. <laughs> How would you guys get on? <laughs> <laughs> it was before my time. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is that I feel like the biggest criticism that one could level um, at at the Utopia model is, um, or you know, in terms of comparing it to the SDN that we talked about earlier, the software defined networks, is that it seems to me like it is hard harder to differentiate than what we expect to be happening on software defined networks, and I'm curious whether uh, you know for the the two ISPs on here if you. Um, if you think about that at all, if there's ways in which you feel like the technology is holding you back, or if I'm just living in a fantasy land in terms of the, um, the kinds of applications that might be developed in the future. Pete, do you want to go first? Yeah, we've had some call for SDN and in most cases, it's just, uh, you know, looking for redundancy in their connection that's automatically switched. We, the, I really feel like it's apples and oranges when you say uh, SDN versus the Utopia model. Um, we can do SDN over Utopia if, if necessary, but um, the, the fundamental aspect of Utopia is how can we best deliver bandwidth with the most amount of choice for the customer? And this is it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, it's not perfect, but I'm fairly satisfied with the way that things work between us and, and Utopia. And, and uh, you know, we do have customers come to us as an ISP looking for SDN, SD-WAN type services. Uh, typically, they're business customers who want to connect multiple sites, multiple campuses. Uh, it's a hot topic, but I, I, don't, I don't see it as a really an issue here for Utopia and us. And then my other question is, uh, let's go forward to this five years from now in which um, Kim doesn't even bother trying to go to sleep at night. Utopia has large presences in the entire Mountain West out to California, and um, you have an addressable market of 2 million people. Um, are you trying to address that entire market, or do you feel like you still kind of like focus on certain regions? Do you have a sense of, of how as this potentially scales up to the point at which I start criticizing it for being too big, um, that you respond as ISPs? I actually, um, first of all, I had this conversation with Roger earlier that I said, Chris is going to hate us one day when we get too big. <laughs> so, uh, but you're going to get I that mean, Metronet experience from me. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Um, would, I, would Pete or Cameron like to answer this question or would, yeah. You know, I <laughs> personally, I, I want to see Utopia focus on our high density metropolitan areas. Uh, we're a rural provider, right? We serve 44 rural communities. Um, I think we do a pretty good job. We spend a lot of investment dollars to give those customers a good experience. I don't really want to see Utopia come into our rural communities. I'm happy to see them focus on the high density areas. So. Okay, well, let's let's say it for a second that they just go to to Boise, Portland, Spokane, like all of the the major density areas, and we still have two million addressable customers. Yeah. Are you trying to provide customer service to folks in Seattle? Well, you know, it, it's an interesting thought. Uh, and this model opens up opportunities for ISPs like Beehive. Kim, you've, you've expanded into uh, Idaho or you're about to expand into? So we are um, an operational partner um, in Idaho Falls on their network. Um, so we manage all their operations. Um, but we do have conversations uh, throughout the country right now with different municipalities um, and, and what, how we can help these, get, these people get off the ground. 
For, yeah, for ourselves, you know, we've had conversations with uh, a potential open access networks in, in Colorado, in Texas. And uh, if we can find a way to, uh, if, we can, if we can get reasonable transport, because transport adds to our cost of goods, uh, we can deliver service in, in Dallas. We can deliver service in Idaho or Colorado. Uh, it's definitely a possibility. Um, and it's not, it's, not, it's not out of the realm. That, that could work for us. And I think that's what's beneficial to the utopia is that we can, for the, some of these open access networks that are starting up around the country, we can already provide them um, for the ISPs who choose to participate, an ecosystem of ISPs who understand how to operate on an open access network, um, where a lot of ISPs have, are not familiar with this space, um, <clears throat> like Travis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, if I was Pete's marketing person, I would say, we can protect your privacy anywhere in North America. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and I think we have built up a name in Utah and, and, uh, for X Mission. And in the early days of dial-up, we tried reaching out into Nevada and, and Idaho, and it was a disaster because nobody knew who we were. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to follow Utopia wherever they're willing to go. Um, but I can see other providers, regional providers that are uh, more known in other areas doing better than us in those areas. Um, the other thing I was reminded of is there used to be a, an internet service provider called Mindspring, and they were a peer of ours uh, back in the dial-up days, and it, both uh, the way they ran their business and, and how they ran their business and how they treated their employees, um, and they got to be a very large size, and then Earthlink came in and bought them, and the rest is this kind of decline in service. Um, I, I'm, I've had the opportunity to sell off X Mission a dozen times, um, but I knew that what would happen inevitably was it would be a great deal for me, but a raw deal for my employees and a raw, raw deal for my customers. So I don't know what it would be like to service a million clients. Um, I'd sure like to give it a shot, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah. Mindspring brings back memories of, uh, I, I mainly interacted with it as uh, the pages it hosted. I remember it was like a GeoCities. There was a lot of Mindspring pages out there early in the, the internet. Anything else that we want to hit? I mean, we're a little bit, we're right at time, so um, we can wrap up. But I'll make sure. I, 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 I wanna, okay, go ahead, Pete. The White House is talking about investing in broadband infrastructure out there, and I wish I could stand on the top of the White House and yell at them, look at, look at what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, because all uh, indication that I've seen from the people pushing ideas back there is nobody knows about Utopia. Gigi Sohn made that point today. Go ahead, Kim, you're going to make no, that. No, I was going to say, we're hearing more. We're, we're hearing more. A lot of people are talking about the Utopia story more and more that, um, nationally. Uh, but yeah, like, because I'm hearing from public policy groups out of Washington, D.C. right now. So Pete, keep your phone um Come on, because I'm you'll be ready. getting calls from you, me, to take some interviews yeah. if, you're, if you're ready for them. I was just looking Absolutely. to see, because today the House Energy and Commerce Committee had a hearing about broadband, and in it, in the middle of it, Gigi Sohn, who's quite heavily followed among that crowd, was like, why the heck is nobody talking about Utopia? So, Kim, if you didn't see that, I, I assume it's because you're preparing for this show, but you really should try to do your job. <laughs> preparing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had uh, I actually had a meeting, but I've heard a lot that went on. So I was wondering, like, I probably will try to figure out where it's recorded and watch it. But yeah, no, Gigi Sohn has been a huge advocate and uh, she's been following the Utopia story. But yeah, I think a lot more people are pushing what's happening here in Utah because, but one of what we're seeing and, and Pete kind of alluded to this, but part of the Biden bill and is saying that they're going to prioritize municipally owned networks and open access. So to even say that open access is even right now part of that conversation, I think is a huge win, which has never been discussed before. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a lot to be uh, worked out in terms of the details that we'll see. Um, but uh, I don't think this is the last we'll hear of it, um, no matter what happens this summer. Um, I do not think that as of three years from now or two years from now, most Americans will be happy with their broadband service. So like, we're going to have another chance to screw it up and then get it right, I hope. <laughs> um, with that, I go ahead, Cameron. Well, I was just say, I'm sure that, you know, five years from now, our lowest package will be a gig. You right. know, just the way it goes, so... Oh, yeah, but Chris still won't be happy, just so you know. Because <laughs> yeah, it's too expensive. 
So <laughs> no, I'll be on your chair graphics. I'm very excited for Terragraph St. Paul. Um, you know, as soon as you need there, to move. this, what is a St. Paul you're always talking about? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so wonderful over here. You have to pay more to do work here because it's so great. Oh yeah. We're finding that out too, by the way. Yeah. So, all right. Not to belabor this, but is, last question: Does every single home have a fiber in your service area, or what happens if somebody signs up? Do you guys do all the construction so that Cameron or Pete's customer can go live? So yeah, so like we don't build into the house unless somebody signs up. Yep. But when we engineer, we engineer a fiber per premise that we pass. So somebody calls up Pete and says, "I want service," but they don't have fiber there. Then what happens? Um, like th that they don't have fiber inside the house or they have yeah, it in front yeah. of the house. Yeah, okay. so at that point, a Utopia crew would go out and do okay. all the Okay, we, we put in an order to make sure that uh, they're in the footprint. Um, but the other, th the other big difference about Utopia, which I think is, is important to note, is that it's an active ethernet network. Mm -hmm. It's not a passive optical network. Uh, Google is laying passive optical all, all over town um, on wherever they go. And I think, Active Ethernet is the superior network. It's more expensive, but whatever bandwidth you're sold is the bandwidth you get. Travis Hallelujah. is very big on Hallelujah. Travis is bigger on inactive Ethernet. He's no. uh, he likes the uh, the more passive Cause, Ethernet. Because when we thing. started rolling out our active Ethernet plant in Minneapolis, here people scoffed at us. They're like, "Oh, you need to do this GPON ecosystem from this particular vendor." I'm like, "Nah, we're good. We'll just you know." I've never heard anyone say, "God, we have too much fiber in the ground." <laughs> i told you chris see finally pete's my new best friend now so there you go <laughs> <laughs> let's this play some been... apple two later Travis. exactly <laughs> we'll get brian worthens back on who still has that apple two on his desk yes <laughs> thank you all uh i really appreciate a, a fun conversation to get a a sense of this all and uh look forward to, to finding excuses to bring you on another technically perfect show in the future <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for the invitation, Christopher. I'll Glad stop. to be here. <laughs>